Hello, everybody. I am Patrick Darty. Oh, I forgot. I said my name first. I'm supposed to say the show name first. I was daydreaming about Victor Scott making the Cardinals. Um, the show you are listening to, though, is the Road to World Football Show. I am Patrick Darty. Like I said, that is Denny Carter, who you cannot see if you are listening, and you also can't see Mr. Lawrence Jackson joining us today to talk some NFL draft prospects. Lawrence's favorite. Um, in the field or just some people he's finding interesting we're about a month out from the draft the discourse has been raging for far far longer than that since like october probably but yeah real quick i'll put you guys in the spot what do you think of victor scott claiming center field in st louis for the st louis cardinals it's huge i've been waiting for this announcement for literally (laughs) weeks months really and uh thank thank goodness victor you said scott scott victor scott Scott. the second that he's playing left field. That's great. Center field, but yeah. yeah. This yeah. moment to me is better than, you know, uh, Kobe Bryant's last game or when uh, LeBron broke the scoring record. You know, I think, uh, what's his name? Victor Scott. I think this just, you know, tops them all, man. I, I, told, I, pu- I pulled aside my kids today and I said, just remember where you were when Victor Scott was named the starting <laughs> center fielder for the 23 right, right. uh, Cardinals. And, and they both cried, which I thought was amazing. Well, that DJ, means they care. <laughs> DJ Short, Eric Samalski, Chris Crawford, and company, they'll be talking about that in our baseball podcast. Yeah, we're, we're here on our football podcast. We're going to be talking draft prospects. We're going to be talking the news, too, after Lawrence dips out. Uh, we got a Calvin Ridley nugget from our friend Kevin Clark, who's supposedly they used very similarly mm-hmm. to Jamar Chase, per his own head coach, Brian Callahan. I'm going to ask Denny about Anthony Richardson, a, a guy we loved last year. Um, a guy we still love and is apparently getting in a full offseason program. Uh, talk about maybe some of the smoke with the commanders. And uh, they're like getting, they're kind of steaming JJ McCarthy's kind of smoke screen season. Uh, more stuff on the quarterback competitions in Pittsburgh, AIE, uh, Mike Tomlin admitting there is one. And the Seahawks continuing to claim there is not a quarterback competition, but they're doing a very bad job yeah. of it, I feel like. Every day, like Gino. Sure, I mean there are. I mean, there's infinite universes out there. Haven't you ever heard of that theory? I mean, there are some of them where Geno's not our starting quarterback, but the only one we live in is this one, and he's the right. same. Like, wow, my seems yeah. kind of heavy. My, Mike asked. McDonald talked about in another universe, Russell Wilson is still the Seahawks starter. Yeah. I just asked him Sam Howell's name because I forgot it, <laughs> and then he started. Uh, but Lawrence has not forgotten any of the names of his top prospects. And Lawrence, these aren't necessarily. These are not obviously like. Here, these are my best prospects in the entire right, draft. Right. These are just people you wanted to talk about. Do you want to start at quarterback or running back? Yeah, I'll, st- I'll start at quarterback uh, and, and make it easy for folks. There's a lot of guys, you know, that could end up being solid quarterbacks if you look beyond the, I guess, quote-unquote, big three quarterbacks of Caleb Williams, Drake May, and Jaden Daniels. Um, from a fantasy football perspective, um, I, I'll keep it mainly based on uh, Caleb Williams, as we all expect him to uh, be the Chicago Bears quarterback when the draft rolls around. This, fellas, I, I've not read a single mock draft yet. I, I don't read mock drafts because I don't want it to cloud my judgment. But I did hear out of one ear that Caleb Williams should be the number one pick. And uh, if that's the case, um, Going into the situation that he's going into now, he's he's not going, you know, he ain't going to the Ravens or the Steelers, that type of organization, but he is going to a Chicago Bears team, right, that has upgraded the roster on both sides of the ball in offense specifically. They're getting better on the out offensive line, especially at the tackle spots. You saw him trade for uh, Keenan Allen. They got DJ Moore coming off a career year. They brought in um, DeAndre Swift to lead that backfield. So you enter uh, what most people feel like is the top quarterback prospect in Kayla Williams. And I don't see how, if he is the pick, I don't see how uh, him being a top 10 to 12 fantasy quarterback is out of the realm of possibility, especially when we saw what C.J. Stroud was able to do coming into a situation that we didn't think was all that great at all. C.J. Stroud kind of, he came in, he grew with that team, um, and they definitely uh, overachieved. When you look at Caleb Williams here, this is this is set up perfect, right? You got guys who are the number one overall pick, and they usually go into teams that stink. And that's, you know, that's not the case. The Bears coming off a seven-win season, so they're not a bottom-of-the-barrel team. 
they have the pick of the bottom of the barrel team, which was the Panthers. So that's a nice luxury to have. And with those uh, with those weapons around him, I think he could find himself some early success, especially with that uh, low key rushing upside. Well, it's Lawrence. It's weird to think. Yeah, you go. Sorry. Down. Yeah, I mean, I as Lawrence was talking, I, I was considering the prospect of a good Bears offense, and I've never deeply you know, troubling, 40, quote unquote. I'm forty I'm years a- old. I've never seen I've never 40 I've never seen a good Bears offense ever. I've never seen a good Bears quarterback. I've never seen any anybody good for the Bears. Period. In 40 years. So, this would be this would be really cool to have like maybe an up tempo, maybe maybe even a pass heavy. Let's get, let's get crazy. Ever flus, let's get, let's get crazy. Let's pass the ball. Let's use our weapons. This would be cool. A lot of different thoughts. First off, Lawrence is correct to shift the conversation from I mean, there's no debate as the number one pick. We know the number one pick. So in fantasy, we can just already start debating Caleb Williams and fantasy. And as Lawrence laid out, the bears seem to be studiously avoiding the mistakes. So many teams with rookie quarterbacks make and just yeah. not surrounding them with enough talent. The bears have certain luxuries. That a lot of those teams <clears throat> don't have for one, this wasn't their number one overall pick. So it's not as bad of a roster as a number one overall pick would typically be coming into Lawrence highlights. They really had momentum down the stretch last year. Matt Eberflus, like finally started doing his job on the side of the ball. So if you're a Bears fan, you can be like cautiously optimistic that the defense, maybe it's not solved, but it's finally headed back in the right direction after it had totally bottomed out following the Vic Fangio 2018 season. Like this, that defense, all remnants of that defense were officially gone in like 2021, 2022. It's building back up uh, as a good unit. And Denny, you mentioned like a good Bears offense. Uh, so the stat, I, I this is not my stat. I can't remember where I read it, but all all, all Caleb Williams has to do to set the single season Bears passing oh record, my gosh. not just the rookie passing record, <laughs> the single season passing record for any Bears quarterback. He just needs to average two hundred and twenty six yards per game. Yeah, and it, th- there's never been a four thousand yard passer in Chicago history, Lawrence. Definitely a low number, especially in this games in today's age. Um, I, he there will be some games when Caleb Williams throws for like one seventy nine and plays some actual good football, but he might run in a goal line touchdown or two here and there in those spots. But seeing the way that he plays, that's just not what you would, what you would expect. And again. He's coming into a much different situation uh, than that of Justin Fields a couple of years ago. So it, it's uh, you got a receiver coming off his best season. You got two receivers coming. You got two 1,300-yard receivers, two uh, bona fide pro bowlers. I don't see how you know it's not good for even both of those receivers. I, if anybody takes the hit, it's probably Cole Komet with Gerald Everett coming in, but this is all good for Caleb Williams to, all even to have the two tight ends. Exactly. Because like, even now, um, if it's a hit for Cole Komet and his fantasy stats, it's still a very valuable real-life player for the Bears. One who's paid as such, as I always have to keep pointing out to Denny and Kyle. Yeah, he's Cole uh, is actually you, you, good. You've messed, you've, uh, Lawrence, you've messed with Pat's favorite. Yeah, uh, you're player. messing with my money now, Lawrence. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <man. laughs> Gerald ever got some money yeah, uh, too, but nah, Cole Komet is uh he he is, if he is good now. If they hadn't got Gerald Everett, he, even you know even the arrival of Keenan Allen, that's gonna mess with it a little bit. And then you got to remember, Cole Komet was a top ten tight end the past couple years. That was with Justin Fields as his quarterback. So we don't know if Caleb Williams will be as locked into the tight end t- tight end position. Also too. Cole Komet was the best receiver for for the until they got DJ Moore, so that plays into it as well. Well, it's just so I, good. I will, so you go, Denny. Yeah, I will say I think that this is shaping up between Keenan Allen and DJ Moore to be a, a very tight uh, target distribution in Chicago. I think those two, uh, Moore and Allen, could you know suck up I don't know fifty plus percent of the targets in the offense. It could be a Waddle Tyreek situation, and uh, and that you know what? Here's the thing: that's fun for fantasy because we know exactly where the ball is going to go. It's right. fun for fantasy, and it's good for the Bears in real life, because Cole Komet may be miscast as someone who's a number two or even number three passing game. Yeah. Now he can be more of a role player, maybe more of like a true red zone presence or third down presence. Gerald Everett 
can pop for big plays down the seam. Even DeAndre Swift, we've spent a lot of time talking about his running game inefficiency. Maybe he can just be a playmaker in the passing game, more like how DeAndre Swift was meant to be used because this is still a deep backfield. They have a lot of options. We don't have to lean on DeAndre Swift the way the Eagles did. And it just seems like the Chicago Bears, we're not used to them doing things right on offense. It's they've, they've done just about everything they can to set Caleb Williams up for early career success. And I don't have my initial 2024 rankings done, but Caleb is going to be – flirting with the top 12 it just kind of in an old school fashion where is a guy who you know, is doing it just mostly on pass attempts and we, we've talked about pass attempts denny being a quarterback stat yeah you'd have to imagine that's sticky with caleb williams for sure and i mean yeah and, and caleb williams look if he completes 11 passes he is instantly the best co- bears quarterback of all time and <laughs> and, hey, and listen and once they get that w- w- once they get that guy in a dome which they're doing soon it's over for the league. Stop. You know, you, you get the, these guys in the dome. This offense is going to go berserk. Stop. Uh, but by the way, you, I could give you guys quite literally 500 guesses, and you would never know who the Bears is all time single season passing record holder is. It's from 1995, and yeah. that still wouldn't narrow it down. Jim uh, Harbaugh. I wish that's a no, really good guess. It's, isn't it Eric Kramer? Kramer. How do you know this? Ah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, no, you know why? Because yeah. I, I was an Eric Kramer sicko in like in like Madden '94 or whatever. Yeah, this is right. Denny's age is showing here. Um, oh, it is <laughs> Kramer a, war, war number twelve, I believe. Yeah, oh, man, you guys, I'm sh- Denny. I'm I'm only I'm a young guy. I'm 37. No, He's a he Kramer was a pure is. pocket passer like we used to have him in the old days. <laughs> but the second through fifth Bears single season passing records are held by Jay Cutler. No, come on, he, man. Cutler. He never Cutler hit 4,000. It's Cutler. crazy that Cutler ain't never hit 4,000. I know. He did in Denver. And then um, Josh McDaniels tried to fight him and trade him. Uh, Lawrence, who is the first running back you want to talk about? What kind of impact might they make in fantasy? Where might they go in the draft? Uh, hit us up with your first name. Yeah, so uh, Braylon Allen out of Wisconsin, right? Now, the thing about the running backs in this draft class, I, I don't think uh, we're expecting to see two of them go in the top 12 like we saw Bijan and um, Jameer Gibbs do. It did, and when we saw that, we immediately knew they would have instant fantasy value. We didn't know in which way. We didn't know that, you know, Arthur Smith was going to use Bijan half the time or less than half the time, or that it would take half the season for Jameer Gibbs to, you know, get get a real role. But this running back class, uh, there's about seven or eight guys who could be picked as the first running back. We don't know when it's gonna happen. Probably the middle of the second round. And then you get a and, and then you get a um then you get a run going. But the thing about Braylon Allen is uh big guy in a lot of you know every time you have a big guy you kind of think like Gus Edwards type of player but he's Uh-oh. anything yeah he's really not that type he's not just a big dude who's gonna run at you and try to truck you he's got he's got some good footwork in there when he's you know maneuvering himself uh through the holes obviously not a uh not a big pass catcher right and we love that in fantasy but what he does do at an extremely elite level is pass protect. And that, too, isn't even because he's big. He could just seek it out, identify, and attack him. And when you get most of the guys who's smaller than him, it's a little bit easier. And we know that keeps you on the field. So he's got enough speed to uh, run you a long run. He's He's good enough to get a couple carries. And when we were talking about running backs last year, like Roshan Johnson, hoping he could get that role, um, I would say uh, Braylon Allen is a, a much better prospect coming in. So he could come in and be somebody's number two running back uh, off the rip. And we know running back twos are, and especially depending on who they're backing up, could become a uh, valuable assets behind that starter and even have a standalone value it's funny uh with braylon out when you said gus edwards by the way i thought you were gonna say he was gonna end up on the chargers and they, they were just gonna have like an <laughs> army of gus edwards is the one thing i know about braylon allen so far is kind of like you said that he's a big guy but that he, he doesn't necessarily run like a big guy right and, and the, combined with he wasn't like a total zero as a pass catcher but he's not gonna be a pass catcher as a rookie I do just wor- worry. He's got traits the teams are going to bet on. 
But if he yeah. kind of like this ends up in like fantasy no man's land as a rookie, because yeah. he is an interesting overall prospect, Lawrence. Just not sure about like rookie year. Obviously, like, it, it, it's going to be tough for all of these rookie running backs, to be honest. And that's what a lot of the folks in the uh, fantasy kinfolk world, they're not ready for that yet. No. But this is why you saw all these teams loading up at running back. They were getting there. You like We just talked about Swift and the Bears, mm-hmm. um, the Eagles and Saquon. We saw the Giants like, oh, we, we just saw Devin Singletary have himself a year. We got to get somebody. To, like, they're not banking on Eric Gray or, you know, some some rookie running back. At best, you know, like some somebody will pop out due to, you know, injuries or something like that. But it is hard for me to see a guy right now just coming in and just starting week one out of any of these running backs. It'll be about the situation for uh for most of these guys. So, you know, talking about a guy like Braylon Allen, he's definitely good enough to come in behind someone and have you know, and have some value perhaps, but uh, it, it'll be tough to be like, hey, this guy could be Jameer Gibbs type production year one. I, I will say that he strikes me, uh, Braylon Allen strikes me as a dog and coaches like dogs. He's yeah, got really, really he, high he, dog. He level. definitely, he definitely a dog. And while he doesn't always run like a big dude, He's big, so he'll truck you if he really wants to. But he, but he does have, he does have good footwork uh, running in between the tackles. Yeah. yeah. The Giants heard Devin Singletary was at LaGuardia Airport and just sent a member of the front <laughs> office there to get him signed. Like, just, just take I mean, look, look at the Commanders too, right? They picked up Austin Eckler to put him with Brian Robinson. So if they draft, if the Commanders drafted a running back. How would we really feel about that? Like, if somebody feel like Trey Benson from Florida State is the best running back and he goes to the commanders, well, we ain't going to love that for fantasy because you got two running backs you competing with for touches. There's not a spot right now where it's just like, hey, you're the guy. I, uh, I'm i laughing about uh, the, 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 oh, the scenario <laughs> where the, the Giants front office sends people to <laughs> – to send the players passing through LGA, they send yeah. someone there to see if they might just, want to sign. just scoop them up and put them in, in a limo and get to the <laughs> facility and sign a contract as soon as possible. Let's, let's make sure get them in the Delta Lounge, don't let them leave. <laughs> yeah. send the car immediately, it doesn't even have to be a limo, it can be an SUV, it's fine. Y'all better make sure y'all don't go over there, then they'll be trying to pick y'all up. And you don't want to play running back for the Giants. No, I don't, I don't want to play uh, running back at all. <laughs> you, wait you telling me denny with 20 carries you couldn't get 10 yards that's like a big question <laughs> on, on social media like hey, if they give you however many carries uh, could you gain one nfl yard no the answer is no I, I i would just easily set up my blocks and follow them for one yard <laughs> would you have your hand in front like this yeah. yeah yeah i would have like i would make it i'd be so my wrists couldn't bend so they wouldn't immediately break my wrist, and I would just like smash through them. That is through them. that is a funny scenario. No, the answer is absolutely. You get you would gain negative forty five yards. I have twenty <laughs> carries for twenty eight yards. Who's laughing now? Um, so, uh, real, real quick, before we get to the second running back, we we don't need to dwell on this, but the way you guys are both talking and the way everyone's talking, not to be smirched, these young men, but this is probably the worst running back class, like maybe ever. We we know running back has been devalued. It's the first year where I can't remember anyone making a first round case for any running. Yeah. Like no one's even bothering to make a case for any of these guys going into the first round. And it just seems like, and as Lawrence said, the way people attacked running back and free agency just really speaks. Yeah. To that. I mean, look at the Steelers aren't even going to take a running back in the first round. <laughs> no, it, 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 the Steelers it, aren't it, doing it. It's going to be tough for a running back to go first round when you got a, you know, a lot of receivers that will go in the first round. Lawrence, who's the second running back you want to tell our listeners? About? Uh, Louisville running back I, Isaac Garendo, who we a lot of people probably didn't know he existed until he, you know, had all these combine numbers at 220 pounds. But I let y'all know he's actually a good running back. He's got good explosiveness, burst. Uh, you know, the type of guy that you you know just throw on the 49ers, let him run a couple of kick returns, and then we all saying. Put him in, coach, but we just – we got Christian McCaffrey. What do you mean? But because he ran that 4-3, you know, but s- same situation as <laughs> – same situation as Braylon Allen. I-, I won't get too deep into this because, like I said, it's the same 
for a lot of rookies. He is a different type of running back, one cut type runner, also could come in and be a team's uh, backup running back. The thing about him, though, is he could return kicks, and he did that while at Louisville. So the more opportunities you get on the field, the more you get to show. Remember, we saw Tyreek Hill start out as a return man, and he used that opportunity to become what he is now. So, you know, just another guy who could cut Like if these guys get on good teams, you know, you get them around the goal line and boom, there you go. Next thing you know, you're drafting them because you got Isaiah Pacheco or something, you know? Right. Yeah. Uh, Grendo actually pops in a, a few uh, stats and metrics, um, 6.1 yards per attempt last year at Louisville one of the highest in the nation. Um, and then he was uh, top 15 in yards after contact per rush. Uh, so, you know, it, it seemingly an, an explosive guy, probably a good complimentary back for, uh, for a running back needy team. Yeah. He just, his problem is that he seems like he maxes out as a complimentary back and never even came close to 200 carries. Never, never got a thousand yards. And the, the big problem for him, is I know he's old. I think he turns 24. this summer. 32. <laughs> he's 32 <laughs> i mean the nil stuff's getting out of control but, but there's a guy in the NSH that guy who went nuts on oregon he's 25 years old but i'm not making this up the guy who, like took over the game for oregon against creighton the other night is literally 25 oh uh, like, really yeah i know it's kind of sad i was like maybe this guy's uh, a process well, hey, and he's 25 he's 25 pat he's <laughs> He's got a family. This man, he's been doing this. He, no, not he was grown man this. hooping against yeah, Creighton. He's he not new to this. He's true to this. <laughs> he was high school class in 98. <laughs> he has two mortgages. Amazing. Wow, two and a half. I wish, known that. I wish I had known that before I picked Oregon. I know. <laughs> man, an old guy. But yeah, how, can you, how do you say this guy's last name, by the way? The Louisville guy? Garendo. Oh, oh man, no. Pat, you're gonna struggle with that. I, this, I'm in hell already. <laughs> he does. Um, he kind of reminds me of Chase Brown, with the, the huge exception is that he never had like a workhorse year like Chase Brown. He um, does have that kind of burst, that initial burst. He definitely has that. Except with Garendo, like you ain't catching him. <laughs> with Garendo, people like Garendo, we just have to remember too. Like college running back profiles, teams are finally getting better about using players different than they were used in college. It's no longer like, well, this guy was never uh, a yeah, backout. True. Or like yes, Jameer sir. Gibbs, even last year, got more run than you would have expected from his college <clears throat> profile. And teams are finally getting better at like typecasting guys just because of how they were used in college. Um, we'll get right, we'll be right back with Lawrence uh, to talk two receivers. We are closing in on MLB opening day, but it is never too late to squeeze in another draft. So for those cramming before the regular season begins, grab your Roto World Baseball Draft Guide. It's loaded with comprehensive positional rankings, projections, and player profiles to ensure your draft is a home run. Visit NBCSports.com slash draft guide and use promo code BASEBALL24 to get 10% off at checkout. Matthew Poliot is moving Victor Scott up in his rankings as we speak. Um, Lawrence, who is the first receiver you want to tell our audience about? Uh, it was a familiar name to listeners of this show. Yeah, uh, so... Keon Coleman out of uh, Florida State. And the reason I'm going to talk about him and the next guys, because when you look at guys like uh, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, and Roma Dunze, um, they, they're not going to have the opportunity to go to as good a teams as these two guys have, especially a guy like Keon Coleman. You get him the possibility. Remember, the Steelers still don't have another guy. You get him on a Steelers, Bengals, a Ravens, a Cowboys type team at the back end of that draft. If he's on a top tier team as your as the team's wide receiver to this particular player, Coleman, I feel like he could make the Pro Bowl as a rookie. Uh, that's how good he is at playing football. Damn that forty yard dash! He's an above the rim expert. Not only that, he's elite after the catch. And even though he's 6'3", 215, he got jukes like Le'Veon Bell. Like, that's how he runs with the ball. Like, they had this dude returning punts at Florida State. Remember, 6'3", guy who run a 4'6", returning punts. And he broke a lot. He broke more than a few of those punt returns. So, um, I think and, and once that happens, I think we'll see – Guys like Keon Coleman, if they get picked at the end of the first round, depending on which teams they go, 
we might see people value them in fantasy just as good, just as much as those top three at the beginning of the draft. Then have you developed any Keon Coleman opinions yet, or is it kind of early in the process? It's very late in the process for some yeah. people. It's kind of early in the process. Yeah, it strikes me, I, I guess, as a volatile kind of prospect. Uh, hugely, hugely. Yeah, like like maybe high risk, high reward. I know he has some drop issues, which I don't really put a lot of weight on, but um uh, i mean i i could see i could see him uh slotting into a team that needs some wide receiver depth and uh commanding some targets uh, hopefully the downfield variety so he can you know make the most out of it uh but like i said you know kind of volatile kind of up and down maybe uh a, a, a fantasy option at some point who could give you some big days but there will also be a lot of frustrating days mixed in there you know because because of the nature of the targets he's going to get the only thing that matters is that he's 20 on draft day um, so 20 he's very, on draft day very very projectable he turns 21 in may so it's like two weeks after the draft yeah. but still uh, yeah 21. and, and talking about all these uh, every it seemed like nowadays every guy going into the draft is 25 years old so to have a guy who gonna get drafted as you know still a little baby boy you know it's kind of you know it's kind of refreshing true junior not a you know sixth year junior <laughs> with the covid year behind him you know this is a true junior we got here he's a true junior who still somehow already has a transfer on his resume but and had a hell of a year at michigan state as a sophomore too he did when i only thing when i pull up his college box scores i see i see a touchdown score I will say that. So he might right. be someone who knows how to use this huge frame. And I did not know the punt return detail. That's pretty interesting. Oh, you you gotta you gotta look that up, man. He 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 can go on them punt returns. Just good vision, elusiveness. Yeah. So a really really interesting prospect, Lawrence. Who is the fifth and final player you want to talk about? Uh, another guy, Adonai Mitchell, out of Texas. You know, I, I we probably talk about Xavier Worthy a little more because of the four two one forty. This guy, damn near just as fast, ran the 4-3-3 at the combine at 6'4", I think 205. Man, man. Um, think about this guy. Is an, this is another guy who could probably go middle or, or, or to the late part of the first round. He He's that type of talent. And why the reason why people say this is a deep class is because of these guys. And I throw Xavier Leggett in there as well, but... A lot of those guys after the top three is why this is considered a deep class. Adonai Mitchell, you know, he's not just a uh, – he's he's no one-trick pony. Obviously, with the speed, he could get on the top of the defense. He could beat you deep. He could beat you in the intermediate game, and he could beat you short. He could get off the line of scrimmage. He's good at that. He was the guy – he was their uh, – he was their number one receiver uh, – um, I'm sorry, Xavier Worthy was more like the flanker, uh, the number two guy. But Adonai Mitchell is the guy who could develop into that number one receiver. But for the start, you want him as your number two behind an elite uh, option like a C.D. Lamb, who some people compare him to because of how he can run uh, after the catch. But both of these guys, Keon Coleman and Adonai Mitchell out of uh, out of Texas, their situations, I believe, you know, will get people talking in fantasy just depending on how many receivers they had. Like, if you get a guy drafted to the Bears, you're gonna be you're gonna be a little quiet and cold on that. Like, if Marvin Jones goes to the Bears somehow, right? I don't think we're gonna love that. We we not gonna love that. It'll be good for football, but would you rather have? Marvin, I, did I say Marvin Jones? You did, but we were I rolling mean, with it. We knew who you meant. Yeah. Marvin, <laughs> if 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 I got Marvin Harrison on the Bears, <laughs> I didn't know Marvin Jones already had a son. I mean, I know he's, <laughs> he, does he got a son in the league already? <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> so uh, that's well, why he's still in the league. He's been waiting to play with his son, like <laughs> yes, LeBron. There you go. Like LeBron. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if, if you got Marvin Harrison Jr. <laughs> um, on the Bears as opposed to Keon Coleman or Adonai Mitchell on let's say the Cowboys or the Steelers, then we might say, oh, l l let's look at this now because you got Keenan Allen and DJ Moore over there. It's like a situation with Jackson, Smith, and Jigba. Like, we not loving that right now. 
No, and some of us were not loving it last year and didn't see how it was supposed to work, and then it didn't. And now every day they're saying Sam Howell is not the starter. Uh, but Ad- Adonai Mitchell, by the way, just talking about a true size speed freak. I mean, it's, he never had a thousand yard season, which you know, blah blah blah. Uh, but a scary physical profile. And, uh, and what was I going to say about Adonai? And the the important important thing, he's twenty one and a half. He turns twenty two in October, so he's still very projectable. I, he's going to be a guy I feel like the people are just all over in Dynasty, like all, yeah. all over for a variety of reasons. He uh, scored a touchdown on 22% of his receptions last year. That's a lot. Uh, I like to score. Yeah. And that's when uh, Adonai Mitchell says, uh, we got to get Lawrence out of here, though. Uh, Lawrence, mm-hmm. really, really, really good stuff. Thanks, um, Lawrence. Yeah, I feel no, enlightened. I feel, I feel like I learned. I need to try to remember it now. Garindo. And not Marvin Jones. Not Marvin, <laughs> not Marvin Jones. Uh, Lawrence, thank you so much. We'll talk to you later. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Denny, it seems like a good time to maybe take our final break, read our final yeah, promo. Sure. Um, yeah, is it is it about the Cardinal center fielder? It's about Victor Scott, of course. Victor Scott, get 10% off any jersey purchase. <laughs> um, no, we'll be right back. After this, the Premier League race is tightening, and one of the most important matches of the season is this Sunday when Erling Haaland and Man City take on Arsenal as the Gunners try to claim their first title in 20 years. Watch the matchup at 11.30 Eastern, only on NBC and Peacock. And don't forget, find all your favorite NBC Sports shows and Amazon music. Just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports. And Erling Aland, you want to talk about a, a grown man? Um, yeah, that you know, looks large. Uh, he likes to score. He Look, as Kyle large. would say, he looked large. He's very large. He likes to score. He's extremely, extremely Scandinavian. He's the most scary Scandinavian man on the planet. Uh, no, I, I'm frightened just by the picture. <laughs> I've never actually seen him play, but I'm a little frightened. He'd be an absolutely lethal um, NFL wide receiver. So Denny Lawrence is gone. It's back to the dreary news. And if I say back to the news, there was actually like no news at all. Well, I mean, the, so the, we do have a little news about Josh Jacobs' potential role in the Green Bay backfield. Um, we do Josh Jacobs can, he can do it all, but it sounds like he didn't do anything particularly well last season, but you per you, they're talking up his pass catching. Yeah. So two things about this story that kind of caught me, caught my attention. Uh, Matt LaFleur was at the uh, coaches meeting today and he, and he told reporters about Josh Jacobs that he quote, had nothing to do with that signing. Um, wow. didn't even know it was happening. I, you know, that, Seems strange to me. It seems strange. It's, it's also, I wouldn't normally believe that, except for Brian Gutekunst has a history of doing that. I, I like, they, like never know. Like I had no idea we were drafting Jordan Love. Like no one knew. Like, right, no. right. Uh, I guess, I guess Lafleur is fine. What did Bill Parcells say? You gotta let me buy the groceries if you want me to cook the meal. I guess, yeah, I guess yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Lafleur is good with just cooking. And know? Bill Parcells just spent three hundred and fifty dollars on red meat. <laughs> <laughs> Forty <laughs> percent of the salary cap going to two. It's right. a generational thing. Bill Parcells is part of the generation, of course, that has never once had a glass of water. No, no, no. no. And we respect them. We respect water. them. Mm-hmm. So all we think about is drinking water. But um, yeah, so uh, Josh Jacobs, he uh, Lafleur talked about his uh, pass catching role in the Packers offense. He would presumably be the primary back in place of Aaron Jones, AJ Dillon, as you predicted. Resigned with the Packers, which is just amazing. I put barely, uh, barely over the league minimum. I, I guess there was just simply no market. Even Aaron Rodgers didn't want him in, in oh, uh, man, New York. A low blow. I, you know, I just uh, Denny, I just thought of the Star Wars meme. By the way, somehow AJ Dillon returned. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that meme? <laughs> so, uh, yes. But, uh, um, so, so here's here's the what the athletic story said. Uh, LaFleur said AJ Dillon could quote, be a high volume guy in this offense. Okay. Oh, he, and then Matt Schneidman, the athletic re- reporter writing the story said, AJ Dillon is a cut candidate in the summer. So um, we, we wow. have to keep an eye on that. If I think if Dillon is released, if they part ways in the, in the coming months, then I would, I would feel a little more comfortable with Josh Jacobs role. Um, although I, I, I'm, I'm good with it. For now, the pass catching would help a lot because um, maybe it was just the abysmal nature of the Vegas offense last year. But 
Josh Jacobs uh, metrics were really awful, like eye-wateringly awful last yeah. year. Um, AJ Dillon, bottom 10 in uh, uh, rush yards over expected per next gen stats. Okay. Uh, one of the guys, one of the only guys worse than him was, of course, Josh Jacobs. Um, so that, that worries me a little bit, but we can smooth over that. We can kind of forget about that if we're getting three to five targets a game for Josh Jacobs. It is a lot of extenuating circumstances for Josh Jacobs where he was coming off the mammoth touch season. He then reported late. They changed coaches mid season. No one liked the head coach. Uh, you know, the head coach who, as you pointed out in a recent show, didn't exercise Aaron Jones as fifth year team option, Josh McDaniels, and then made him like the only player who touched the ball in 2022. So this is a really, really weird situation. I think Josh Jacobs is going to have a normal off season this year. I think he'll probably – he was pretty efficient in 2022 despite all he the was. I think he'll be more efficient this year. And the only person better at is like inexplicably getting the ball all the time than A.J. Dillon is Josh Jacobs. Yeah. I don't think we should be too worried about Josh Jacobs and his potential workload. Yeah, but, but, uh, but we do need to uh, rid ourselves of the idea – of AJ Dillon as a guy who could like pop up and like win you. If, uh, if, speak, if, if speak Josh Jacobs. Oh, 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 oh. I thought you were going to say rid ourselves the idea that he could like ruin you a week. Uh, no, yeah, no, no. What I, what I mean is like he's, he's been drafted the last two years, three, however long yeah. it's been as a guy who's going to, going to you know take all the carries, be the workhorse. The contingency goes, back. Didn't he goes down and yeah, he does get all the carries and he does absolutely nothing. <laughs> truly, truly not. He, he, he failed the social media, can you gain, what, 20 yards on 10 carries challenge. Uh, A.J. Dillon has never once done that. Despite despite the thighs. Yeah, despite the thighs, despite being a professional football player, he's never done it. He, in fact, Pat Corain took the challenge and easily outrushed him. It was very sad, actually. <laughs> well, the media has been silent. On they this. have been dead silent on Corain's heroics. Uh, we will no longer be silent on the Steelers quarterback situation that we keep <laughs> talking about every show. Yeah. Uh, we have to keep talking about every show because we do, we do have a development. I, it's a genuine development. <laughs> Mike Tomlin spent a very brave 10 days claiming Russell Wilson would be the starter <laughs> for admitting that. All right. It's kind of a competition. <laughs> That's he, held for 10 days. he got one text from Russell Wilson. I was like, all right, I'm opening this competition up. <laughs> he got a text from Russell Wilson saying, let's weld. Yeah, and, in the uh, middle of the night, like, and Justin Fields, you get a chance to start. <laughs> and, he, and then Tomlin texted Justin Fields and said, you better buckle up. You're the starter, buddy. <laughs> yeah, you're the, st- you're the starter. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was – hey, I have to I have to get – I didn't think that this charade would go on for more than a week. And and he and he went – yeah, he went 10 days. And that – hey, that's a that's a good long time to pretend Russell that's Wilson good. is your starter. <laughs> a really, really good point. Eh? Most coaches would have given up after a day or two. Most after – yeah, within hours of signing Justin Fields, they would say, yeah, okay, you you all know what's up. Like, obviously, we're, we're, we cannot have Russell Wilson as our 17-game starter. I'll ask you um, off the top of your head, who would be better for the overall Pittsburgh fantasy environment, Russell Wilson or Justin Fields? Uh, I, you know, I'm torn because the thing about Justin Fields is that he he scores all the fantasy points, but he doesn't. He does, do- but he, he when he finally got a decent supporting cast, he did create like contingency. Like he made DJ more. Right. Points. Right, 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 right. So he, so DJ Moore, really good last year with Fields. Can George Pickens take on that massive air yards, massive target share role that DJ Moore had? I don't, I don't think so. Um, if he did, then you know we're talking about a wide receiver one in fantasy and in, in George Pickens. I, I, I tend to doubt that that would happen. I, I know that F- Fields as a starter for, for Pittsburgh uh, would be borderline catastrophic for the running backs. Um, and what I mean is they're not going to ever score a touchdown, uh, if, if Justin Fields is the, is the, is the quarterback and, and he's going to take, you know, short, short yardage stuff. Uh, so yeah, you, you don't, if you, if you're heavily drafting Warren and Harris right now, uh, in best ball, you desperately do not want Justin Fields to be the starter. And this information vacuum we have with the Steelers quarterback situation where George Pickens is the wide receiver. What right now? Just without knowing the answer to who the quarterback is really going to be, George Pickens is wide receiver underscore what? 
uh, 25. I was going to say 23. So inside wide receiver two range for me. I feel like you have to bet on one as a wide receiver two just because of how high the upside is. Uh, as, as we we got even moderate and moderately improved quarterback play. I know he, he was like winning weeks during the fantasy playoffs. I know I'm probably too low on him, honestly. I mean, he's, I, he's I should I I need I need to just I need to just ignore some metrics sometimes when a guy has that much dog. I, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah he's, like he yeah. he won't he refuses to be bad. He does, except like, for when he's upset, which is a lot. Well, Deontay Johnson did not refuse to be bad. That's true. That is true. That is very, very true. But but Pickens is different. Um, there's not a whole lot to say on this next topic, but I already joked. I mean, the Seahawks, what, what do you think? I mean, do you really think, am I reading too much into this? Like, like no one's ever asking, it seems like, and then Eugenio's the star. Like, what was like, wow. I mean, I asked that two weeks ago when you signed Sam Howe, but I hadn't asked you again. Mm-hmm. And now you just keep insisting to me, Gino is the starter. Uh, do you think they thou doth protest too much? Yeah, I I, I do think that asking Sam how to get a Gino is the starter tattoo <laughs> on his left forearm. I think that that was too much. That was, was too, too much. much. Uh, uh, say you're yeah, you're protesting too much. Yeah, uh, and you know, no one should be made to do that. No, I I I do. I think Sam Howe is terrible. Um, I'm and, spit out my water. Sorry, <laughs> that's what you get for drinking <laughs> water while I'm talking. Uh, yeah, I think I think he's truly, truly like real, like horrible, like uh, yeah, like bottom bottom tier uh, quarterback. And uh, you know, the sack problem means that he's a, a drive killer, an offense killer, a coach killer. In, in, in if he gets the chance, the star um, killer, um, yeah. you know, galaxy killer. You're right, right. Uh, and and Gino is he's all reliable back there. I mean, he 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 does what needs to be done. I think Mike McDonald's relatively old school defensive oriented. We're not going to score too many points type of coach. Uh, and, and Gino, I think Gino fits that model. Well, I don't think Sam Howe will challenge Gino is what I'm saying. I guess not. I don't know. I could also see the Seahawks being, we don't have our franchise quarterback. We gave, we gave the Gino experiment an extra year. Predictably he regressed off his career year in 2022 We've got this new genius head coach. You know, everyone thinks he's kind of like a Sean McVay type on defense. He's coming from the Harbaugh brothers who are both right. pretty innovative and forward looking. Maybe if we put Sam Howe in a system where he's not required to attempt 50 passes a game. Yeah. That, that was a big part of the Sam Howe yeah. failure is like, yeah, maybe you don't have the guy who takes a trillion sacks drop back 60 times a game. Like, did you ever consider not doing that? Yeah. In Washington. No. I, and I, I hear what you're saying. And I do. And, I think that the Seahawks, you know, they're, they're trying to throw it back. They're trying to get back to like the Richard Sherman type, you know, era of Seattle football. And I, I don't think Hal fits that. I think that, no, that, 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 that Geno Smith, you know, like I said, reliable, doesn't take a lot of sacks, uh, uh, gets the ball out quickly, uh, turnover worthy plays, very low rate of, uh, of turnover worthy plays. Sam Hal is the complete opposite, very volatile, He's throwing the ball all over the place, refuses to throw it away. Uh, I think that he would lose favor pretty quickly with uh, with McDonald. And Geno Smith could probably improve again on a more of like a Russell Wilson style attempts diet where he should be more 25 to 30 than 35 to 40. I don't yeah. quite know what range he was in last year. He wasn't really that high. Uh, let's see real quick. He was averaged. Yeah, man, he averaged 33 attempts per game last season. That should be more like 27 or 28. I mean, look, uh, Seattle was sixth, sixth highest pass rate over expected last year. Um, I think that the Seahawks looked at that and said, never again. Yeah, we'll true. Never. And I think justifiably so, despite their amazing receiver core, uh, that, that they were miscast yeah. doing that. Um, yeah. And it's, it's a part of the culture. Part of the team call, it's, it's cold. It's raining all the time. You know, they're not trying to throw the ball. They're trying to play defense and run the ball. Why do so many people want to move to that metro area then? So a Mount, Mount Rainier is one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the world. I mean, I don't know, maybe just move to St. Louis instead. You better, yeah, you better learn how to speak vitamin D, buddy. If you're moving up to <laughs> Seattle, I've never seen the sun not once. I've watched a lot of Seahawks games over my life, never seen the sun. There actually never has been a sunny Seahawks game. That's not even an exaggeration. <laughs> I, I thought the Seahawks had a dome. They, yeah, they're one of the few teams that made the catastrophic decision to move out of a dome into oh, you know, outdoor. Out. And yikes, didn't need no dog <laughs> levels. Um, well, the Titans new head coach Brian Callahan Denny yeah. told our guy Kevin Clark 
that Calvin Ridley, the surprise free agent signing Calvin Ridley, will have a role, quote, very similar to Jamar Chase's Mm -hmm. in the Bengals offense. Uh, Brian Callahan was the offensive coordinator there. I don't believe he was ever the play caller. I believe that was always head coach Zach Taylor. Uh, But what does that mean? Like, what kind of role does that mean? And what do you think that means in fantasy? Well, I mean, you have Jamar Chase running uh, about 25% of his routes from the slot. Uh, Last year, Calvin Ridley ran 15% of his routes from the slot. So you you would see, you know, a bump there. He ran 15. That's that's seriously all they gave him. What were they thinking? I know. Well, he he profiles as like a slot receiver. He profiles as the total middle of the field dominator, like an absolute tactician over the middle of the field. Yeah, got this guy just devouring boundary routes. So uh, Ridley was top ten in average depth of target at fourteen. You have Chase uh, all the way down at uh, thirty second among receivers at eight point eight a dot. Uh, that's too low, by the way. No, that's it's great. Chance. It's great for fantasy. It is. No, it's great for fantasy. So, so I think that, and, and by the way, Ridley, when he signed with Tennessee he said, I want to run all the routes because he wasn't running all the routes. He was running, running exactly one route in Jacksonville, uh, where he would, he would go out of bounds and just run up the field. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh you know uh, like a gunner on a punt. Yes, so, yes. so, uh, so yeah, no, we, we, we you gotta get, Please, please, Brian Kelly. It sounds like he said, we're done just launching it up to Calvin Ridley. Those days are over. We're going to hammer him with short targets in this offense. And that makes Ridley a much more appealing fantasy option. And in this offense, uh, science is real. No one is illegal. (laughs) And we are launching it up to DeAndre Hopkins. Um, (laughs) Well, Hopkins, yeah, Hopkins had some some deep shots. Now, the problem the problem with all this is that of course, that uh, Will Levis is the quarterback. So yeah, for now, we'll see what happens there. I who did, who did they sign? They signed somebody, right? Um, they signed a backup. There's no way to know. <laughs> he must be really good. <laughs> if we can't remember who they signed, oh, they signed Mason Rudolph. Um, they may bring Mason Rudolph in, do the Pickens plan. They'll be fine. For the, yeah, for the that sounds gross, man. I don't know. Yeah. I I would get I would get a a a, a starter worthy player if I could. If I the Titans, true. Ryan and, uh, not not signed right now. His his name, of course, is oh man, I forget. His name is Jake Browning. He actually resigned already at the Bengals. By I the way. would trade for him. Trade a first for him. Get That's him, true. Get him it it is the coach. Trade a third round pick for Jake. Browning get him on the Titans. Get him on the Titans. Uh, the Titans in the same division as the Colts. A- Anthony Richardson. We made a lot of three unique injuries for a season ending shoulder injury. He's expected to be a full participant participant in the offseason pro- cannot speak anymore full participant in the Colts offseason program Denny are we still as all in on Anthony Richardson this is a question I'm going to ask you like 10 different times yeah this offseason. Uh, or were you scared but a guy who has if you're going to be a dual threat you have to protect yourself he manifestly did not protect himself last year I know and and I don't I didn't really enjoy that as someone who drafted Anthony Richardson on every single team in every single format in my life last summer um yeah, but the the rushing upside it just is too much to deny. You know, I I I know, and you and you warned, yeah, you warned me. You said, ah, I don't know, I don't know about this guy, I don't know. And I said, no, 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 no. He's Derrick Henry. I mean, Kyle said this. He's Derrick Henry at playing quarterback, and so I'm like, okay, I'm in. Like this sounds fun, uh, but he cannot take the hits that he took last year. If that continues, then obviously it's not going to work out. But I will I will say this about Anthony Richardson. He hurt fantasy folks so much last year uh, with those injuries because they happened in game. OK, yeah, and, yeah, and so yeah. it costs you weeks. Right. Uh, he hurt people so to the extent that I think that he will be undervalued in redraft leagues, not not in sicko best ball leagues, not people drafting 400 best ball teams an hour. I'm talking about regular folks playing fantasy football. They're going to look at Anthony Richardson. They're going to say, no, thanks. That guy hurt me last year. That's when you pounce. Regular hardworking American folks drafting yeah, from right? the Yahoo, Yahoo app and the local. I mean, really, truly. Yeah, they're not going to be taking him. But the cranes, you know, while he's like in the hospital awaiting the birth of a child, <laughs> will still be drafting Anthony Richardson is what you're saying. That's right. That's um, it's, it's, in, in the second round or whatever. I mean, you know, that, that's what I mean. You're going to listen. You're going to be able to get this guy in the 10th round of regular and in, in, in normal people, well-adjusted people, fantasy leagues. That's yeah. the Richardson too. 
So one of the reasons, you know, I was kind of like very cool on Anthony Richardson last year was just the total lack of experience. For me, it was more like, man, is this guy like ever going to be able to actually pass at an NFL level? Because it was like, you know, 12 starts. And then the inexperience, it seemed like maybe came from a different angle where he just did not realize that you cannot absorb hits like that and stay healthy. You couldn't really do that in the SEC. You really can't do it in the NFL. So it was the most important lesson maybe he needed to learn. He learned it the hard way. But presumably, quarterbacks have gotten so good at protecting themselves, dual threats these days, that maybe he just needed to learn the lesson the hard way. But I'm assuming we're going to see a much greater emphasis from Anthony yeah. Richardson on protecting themselves this year. We are uh, hoping and praying every day that Anthony Richardson learns how to slide. We are. We very, very, very much are. We are hoping and praying good players don't end up with the commanders, but someone's going to at number two overall, Denny. And now people are trying to create smoke that it might be J.J. McCarthy and not Drake May. I mean, do we believe this at all? Do we care yet? Is it too early? to? So we cannot even dial in on quarter, commander's quarterback rumors to like April 20th. Um, are you taking yeah. any of this seriously? I know. I, I mean, J.J. McCarthy is now the odds-on favorite to go number two overall. Are you joking? Um, uh, well, un unless I've completely misread that, but I believe that's what I read this wow. this morning. I thought that he jumped uh, – uh, Jaden or Jaden Daniels, uh, maybe maybe producer Steven can uh, <laughs> confirm that or deny that. For us. Any out, please. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think that there's something to it. I mean, uh, look, uh, Jaden Daniels is a risky pick. Uh, however, you cut it, I mean, he just he just is. Maybe he has some upside. I think that his downside is like franchise killing. It is um, front office I mean, killing. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, you're everybody's done if the if he if he hits his you know, uh, bottom, you know, bottom half percentile outcome. Uh, McCarthy's not that guy. Um, and I, and I do think whether it's right or it's wrong, I think that front offices will look at the guy who doesn't have much downside and who Jim Harbaugh is obsessed with and say, you know what? Uh, we're going to throw in our lot with that guy uh, because we, we like to be employed and uh, we think that he can, he can be a nice game manager plus. It is interesting to view it as like a bet on Jim Harbaugh, who uh, is just clearly one of the greatest football coaches who's ever lived. You hate to admit it. Um, he's just one of the greatest, and he's riding super high right now. That actually could be a really underrated factor. Yeah, and the J.J. McCarthy, like, well, he's good enough for Jim Harbaugh to win a yeah. national title with. And people, I mean, respect the hell out of Jim Harbaugh for good for good reason. Uh, by the way, Steven, uh, producer Steven says, odds to be number two uh, overall uh, – uh, Jaden Jaden Daniels at minus 170, uh, Drake May plus 135, and JJ McCarthy moves from plus 2500 to plus 500. So big a big jump there for him. What what Stephen or Denny? What what was the Harbaugh quote? I somehow missed this. Did he like? Call oh, he him said like he's the best quarterback in the class. Well, I mean, I would hope that his college coach said that. It uh, makes look. I every time I, I my my heart drops every time I see Harbaugh talking about McCarthy because I'm like. Why don't you just go get him? I, well, I know four first rounders. If you offer four first rounders for Justin Herbert, then they're going to go get him. I, no, I mean, like you're in position to get your guy, Jim. Well, I, I think even Jim Harbaugh can maybe see Justin Herbert is pretty good as well. Um, you said everyone, by the way, respects the hell out of Jim Harbaugh. I tell you, who, who doesn't it is our, our nation's chicken farmers. <laughs> they do not respect the hell out of Jim Harbaugh. The chickens are are cool on Harbaugh as well. <laughs> Well, the, the the chickens love Harbaugh. He says not to eat them. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like the cows at Chick Fil A. Saying yeah, the, the chickens want more Harbaugh brothers. Like we got any more of these crazy guys? Well, for, for those uh, not in the know here, Harbaugh said that uh, he doesn't eat chicken because it makes you nervous and weak or something. Well, he said he said he said he, his exact what about chickens are? They are a nervous bird, and they are. I think he said they like injected something in the nation's bloodstream or something. He said something really weird about chickens. <laughs> <laughs> he's thought a lot about chickens maybe that's my problem i i do eat a lot of chicken maybe i eat a lot a lot of chicken too it's the best out. by far the best meat out there this is by far the best football podcast out there but it's time for it to end for today because we're out of stuff to talk about um, we really appreciate lawrence stopping by yeah talking about some of his favorite prospects we'll hear more from lawrence over the next month and over the next months and years since he works with us um thank you lawrence for dropping by thank you to denny as always thank you to myself for not trying to say the word success. Oh, um, thank you. So for Lawrence, for Denny, I'm Pat. Thanks for listening. We'll be back later this week with Kyle Dvorak and a special guest.